Hello, welcome to Baltic World. My name is Crispin. One thing is for sure, in the wake of the war in Ukraine, massive inflation, global recession, and a worldwide pandemic, is that the Baltic region and the world at large is going through a period of tremendous change. The pre-pandemic era feels like a distant memory. And therefore, in this video, I'm going to present two radical ideas and the arguments that I have to support them. Now, this will be controversial for many people, and I welcome open dialogue and debate. Please leave your comments down below, but let's get started. The first is the more crazy sounding of the two, and that is to restore the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth. For those unfamiliar, the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth was the most successful political union, perhaps competing with the United Kingdom, in world history. For some 250 years, the Poles and the Lithuanians were united in a single kingdom, which at the height of its power was over 1 million square kilometers, including most of modern day Belarus, much of modern day Ukraine, stretching right from the Baltic to the Black Sea. It achieved so much. For example, in the 30 years war that ravaged Europe, the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth already had innovated these radical ideas, such as allowing for religious tolerance and multi-ethnic societies to live in one nation. The Treaty of Westphalia would ultimately catch up with the innovation that Poland and Lithuania had already achieved. It had radically expanded political enfranchisement way beyond what had been seen in other parts of Europe, with a full 10% of people being registered as Schlacht and nobles able to participate in the assemblies. Now, 10% isn't a lot by today's standards, but by the standard of the time, it was essentially democratic. And then as a kingdom, it was enormously successful. And it even captured Moscow in 1610. And then in 1683, the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth is what turned back the Ottoman Empire from Europe right from the gates of Vienna. The Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth was ultimately dissolved around the Napoleonic era. So why today in 2023 do I think it's both possible and desirable to restore this massively successful, although archaic, political institution? Well, first, one of the barriers that had previously existed was some of the animosity that continued between, for example, Lithuanians and Poles and some others in the region, well, in recent times, they have been absolutely lockstep on basically every single issue, whether it's foreign policy towards the alliances and Russia and Ukraine, uh, domestic policy, or indeed relations between themselves and the European Union. In almost every way, the Baltic region, the Poles, have been completely united. There is no meaningful barrier in defense and security policy that would prevent them from pooling their resources into a confederation. The second is the recent discrediting of pan-ethno-nationalism across the region. One of the excuses that Vladimir Putin gave for intervening in Ukraine was the so-called pan-Slavic identity, i.e. that really Ukrainians are not a separate nation, but rather part of a greater Russia, a greater Slavic nation, that Russia's raison d'etre is to protect Slavs wherever they are. Where in actual fact, a Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth included Slavs, Ruthenians and others in a single political entity. In fact, the Orthodox Christians, which made up a large majority in what is now modern day Belarus, remained loyal to the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth even during the wars with Moscovy. Which brings me to number three, Lukashenko's regime. Lukashenko is old, he's not going to be around forever, and the government in exile is currently in Lithuania. One day, Belarus will go through a revolution, much like we saw in Ukraine, and it is highly probable that the new government, the new political bodies, will be firmly aligned with Poland and Lithuania. Number four is the political barriers that remain for Ukraine to join NATO proper. While Poland and the Baltic countries support Ukraine's admission into NATO, absolutely, 
there is stern resistance from countries like Germany and France. It is therefore unlikely that we'll see Ukraine's accession into NATO even after the war ends due to the pensive resistance from these Western powers. And thus, given all these factors, the historical success of the Commonwealth, the current warming ties between Poland and the Baltic countries, the need for Ukraine to find economic and military security in a post-war era, and also the unresolved question of what will happen to the Ruthenian Slavs of Belarus once Lukashenko is gone, well, if there was a restored Commonwealth, then there would be a political option for a reformed Belarus as well. Now, to be clear, I don't believe in the dissolution of the national parliaments of any country, but rather something like the current model of the United Kingdom would combine with the EU. A ceremonial president that covers the entire Commonwealth, or even indeed an elected monarch like there was previously, and the ability of the Commonwealth to enter into political and security arrangements with other powers. Now, one might legitimately ask, isn't this duplicating the EU? And in some ways, yes. However, these Eastern European countries have their own political quirks that are quite different to the so-called traditional EU countries, no more so than in the case of Ukraine and other conflicts in Eastern Europe. For example, the Western European allies no longer fear an invasion from the restored Soviet Union. They don't necessarily believe that the war in Ukraine is a threat to their own national security. However, they did engage in conflicts abroad, Afghanistan, uh, Libya, other places, Syria, uh, as a collective security promotion. They don't actually view Russia as a direct military threat, much to the regret, no doubt, of the Baltic countries, Eastern Europe, and much of the establishment in Washington. After all, the EU is controlled along population lines, making it almost a Franco-Germanic empire, particularly with the removal of the United Kingdom. And this brings me to the second somewhat related idea, which is a new collective defense treaty signed between the Nordic countries, Baltic countries, Central and Eastern Europe, and the United Kingdom. All of these countries are essentially in NATO at the moment. And so this would be a duplication, but with its own administration and privileges. So why is this useful? Well, the war in Ukraine has exposed some of the fragility within NATO. The truth is NATO is simply too big. It has too many different interests and it has to bow down to the lowest common denominator. It means that things are constantly watered down and Germany and France can act as spoilers in almost every enterprise. Second, this will reconstitute the role of the United Kingdom within Europe since Brexit. The United States, like it or not, will not be able to support Eastern Europe in the way that it has done in the decades ahead. This is simply impossible. China's rise will preoccupy American defense planners for decades to come. It's a true peer competitor of the United States, and it's a maritime theater a world away from Eastern Europe. Meanwhile, the United Kingdom, in order to remain relevant, to maintain its special relationship with Washington, is going to have to show that it is being useful to America while America is occupied in East Asia. The best way for UK to do that is to make sure that on its other flank in Europe, things are secure, that the British take up a leadership role in promoting peace and stability, particularly in Eastern Europe, where Russia remains a perennial threat. Such a treaty promises many benefits extending beyond NATO. First of all, it allows Britain to provide intelligence and military equipment beyond the current NATO framework to Eastern European countries that desperately need it. It also allows Ukraine to be part of a collective defense arrangement that includes many NATO members without acceding to NATO itself. It allows these like-minded states to act collectively, militarily, outside of NATO without the permission of some of the recalcitrant members, such as Turkey, Germany, and France. Indeed, it may encourage these other players to do more themselves to stop them from being sidelined by this new arrangement. But finally, and perhaps most importantly, it really complicates Russia's escalation pathways. Russia at the moment seems to have worked out where the thresholds are of NATO, how far they can push NATO without having a direct conflict between Moscow and the United States. However, if Moscow faces a new collective defense arrangement involving those states most resistant to Russian expansion, that makes it extremely difficult for them to engage in any kind of aggression without risk of dramatic escalation, particularly since many of those countries are also NATO members. And this is where I bring the two ideas together. A new collective defense arrangement offers an incentive for countries like Ukraine and a reform Belarus to potentially join in the future, 
and also provides a major new power in Europe to balance that of not only Russia, but also the oversized influence of Germany and France, particularly with the departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union. This could be a new pathway for power balancing within Europe, hopefully creating a new golden age for political and economic stability in the region for the decades and centuries to come. And this is where I turn it all over to you. I'm not delusional. I'm a realist. This is not on the agenda right now. But first of all, are these concepts desirable? And do you think it would lead to enhanced peace and stability in Europe? After all, I don't think this could have been raised even as a pie in the sky idea pre-pandemic. I think the hostilities that existed between the different players, the ongoing suspicions, the lack of concern among many about Russia has been completely upended by the experience of recent years and the need for a long-term post-war architecture. I think it's a good thing. What do you think? Leave your comments down below. If you wish to support us, you can do so on Contrabi, a Lithuanian-owned company. Leave a link down below. Thank you very much, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.